The Southern Hemisphere is a fun aviation haven with the Northern Hemisphere having the large majority of the planet's air traffic. Last year we spent some good time in Africa and while we do have more plans for that this year, we'll also try out some South America greats, starting with the topic of today's video, Boliviana de Aviación or BOA, the flag carrier of Bolivia. Bolivia is one of the rare South American countries that actually has a unique carrier of their own and not just a branch of LATAM such as LATAM Brazil, LATAM Chile, Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, and Paraguay. Bolivia has a shrinking international market due to the smaller demand as American Airlines pulled their two routes from Miami to Bolivia after they were losing money, making it increasingly difficult to get to the country with their only connections outside of South America being Miami and Madrid. From San Francisco, the journey to Bolivia involved two airlines and connections in Chicago and Sao Paulo. After all that craziness, welcome to Santa Cruz de la Sierra the largest city in Bolivia and also home to the main international airport for the country. Viru Viru International Airport in Santa Cruz sees about half a million to a million more passengers than the other two main Bolivian airports in El Alto and Cochabamba. This is largely because the main issue with aviation in Bolivia is the elevation of most of the country. Santa Cruz sits at just over a thousand feet with Cochabamba at 8,400 feet and El Alto at 13,000 feet. Since aircraft are much heavier on these long haul flights, these airports are too high for the aircraft to have sufficient performance out of them, so Viru Viru Airport hosts all of these flights. Cochabamba actually did have transatlantic flights from Madrid, but the returning flight would fly to Santa Cruz first so that it was light, and then depart to Europe from there. That's enough ranting, let's head to the curb. Welcome to our travel day to Madrid, which has 20 South America destinations and another 11 Central America destinations, including our origin today, Santa Cruz de la Sierra in Bolivia, home to the long haul flights of BOA. The airport replaced their old one in the 80s and was named Viru Viru Airport from the local Guarani language. Although the origins aren't known, they believe it refers to some geographical feature in the region, either the round hill nearby, the river that used to be nearby but has since dried up, and some thinks it means Pampa Plain, which is the geographic area as a whole. That is, if it is even Viru Viru, as some people think it was originally supposed to be started with a B, pronounced Biru Biru. Regardless, it's a fun and unique origin story and theory. From the curb, there's a few sections of the terminal. The far right is labeled as arrivals. In the middle of the terminal is the international departures, and then the domestic departures are to the left. Heading inside, the air conditioning was immediately felt and greatly welcomed with the summer warmth here in Bolivia. All of this and the best part was just the smell from the upstairs Cinnabon which flooded the terminal with that sweet cinnamony scent. The Boliviana de Aviación check-in desks are located in the middle of the terminal and they're split into domestic and international check-in. Interestingly enough, there isn't a line for business class passengers, so to check-in we just had to join the rest of the international departures check-in line. You'll see on the screens which flights are open for check-in, Madrid was excluded since we were just a little bit too early. In the meantime, one of the best places to kill time here is actually up the stairs next to check-in. On our way there, however, we passed the remnants of the recently dead Amazonas Airlines, which went belly up just a couple months ago. Up the stairs, we see even more stairs, but this time up to an observation deck. The only issue being that since I couldn't check in yet, I had to carry all my bags up the stairs. It was all worth it at the top, where we found a couple small food stands in the entrance to the outdoor patio. Similar to Tokyo Narita's, it sits above the check-in area and you have a view of the parking ramp and then the runways behind that. I did get to see the Air Europa 787 that was headed out to Madrid. Along with that were a whole crowd of people gathering to take pictures of it. As it turns out, they weren't exactly plane spotters, but instead just family and friends of the passengers on that flight, as just after the plane departed from view, the deck was almost completely emptied. Not before I spotted the only other active aircraft out there, including this Ecojet Dornier and this Perenair CRJ. By the time I got back downstairs, Madrid was showing on the check-in board, so I got in the super long queue for check-in. 
they do have these self-check-in kiosks, although they only worked for the domestic departures. After waiting for about 25 to 30 minutes, I realized that I wasn't in the correct line. The big line was actually for people purchasing tickets, so I guess in Bolivia not a lot of people book flights ahead of time. Next to that was the actual international check-in line, of which I was only the second person in line behind the one person with about 200 suitcases. We got our boarding pass, which looked more like a receipt, and this outbound immigration form, then went back upstairs to the entrance to immigration and security. The only issue is that they told me it would be another hour until Madrid passengers could enter the terminal, three hours before departure. In the meantime, I grabbed a seat near the food and got some work done while overhearing a family adjacent to me studying for the American citizenship test. Super cool to overhear, actually. Now here was a bit of an issue because I went back to security and they told me it would be another 30 minutes until we could go through. 30 minutes later they just told us to keep waiting but didn't give us a time and at no point did they explain exactly what we were waiting for. In the meantime the Lima flight which departed after ours was allowed through and after entering the terminal there's no reason they couldn't have allowed two flights worth of people to wait with plenty of space for that so there must have been some other reason. Although a dozen or so people asked why and we were told just to wait a little longer. Slowly, the entire lobby, immediately outside of security, filled up with passengers for this Madrid flight and people were all crowding the entrance knowing that, as soon as they allowed us in, the one security lane and immigration lane would quickly become backed up with the others on this flight. I also wasn't able to leave and sit down because I would have lost my spot in this large swarming crowd. With about an hour and a half to departure, the screen showed the flight as on time, but more importantly it said it was pre-boarding. Even still they wouldn't let us through. After standing for almost two hours, we were finally allowed in and there was a mad dash to get through security and immigration. Once through immigration, we were guided through the duty-free store and then into the terminal where our flight was not yet boarding, although the crew was on board, so it was only a matter of time. There was a central seating area with a few restaurants and some excellent souvenir shops with all local items. There appears to be two lounges in the terminal. The first one was a little confusing. I walked in, there was tables and a bar, but it appeared to be a normal pay-to-use restaurant. The other lounge appeared to be a much more normal lounge. You can see on the front wall which passengers get access, but we do not see BOA. As it turns out, BOA business class passengers don't get any lounge access complimentary at their main hub. Ain't that strange? This lounge is included with priority pass memberships or you can pay 25 US dollars in cash or 33 US dollars with credit card to gain access. This lounge isn't massive, but it also doesn't ever need to hold that many passengers. There's roughly 35 seats, and I was only one of the three people actually in here. The only flights that get complimentary access to this lounge is the Air Europa premium passengers. The buffet was modest, but did have some tasty options. The main part of the buffet was the assortment of sandwiches, some veggie, some with meat. There was also some plantain chips and cereal. For beverages, there was an area for hot drinks like coffee and hot water for the tea around the corner. And below the counter is the cold beverages including Coke and Fanta, then water and beer. Maybe not the greatest spread of food, but I had some good little snacks while waiting about 15 minutes for boarding. But after waiting so long for security, the Coke and a bottle of water were the most welcomed. It really didn't take all that long before our flight began boarding, so I went out to the gate to queue to get on board. I will give them props because the boarding was fairly organized. To avoid gate lice, they have rows partitioned off for each group. Business class passengers are in group 1, so we found that line and waited until they called for boarding. You can see, however, that groups 3 and 4's line does wrap around the corner and into the terminal, so I guess I'm not glad to need that line. With our boarding pass scanned, we went into this hallway where we could get some good views of our airplane. In here, we were all instructed to put our bags against one wall and stand against the other. 
This was so that the canine unit could do a sweep of our bags. It was fairly seamless except for the bag that he alerted his handler of. No clue what was going on there, but they pulled him and his bag aside and we continued down the jet bridge. Welcome on board Boliviana de Aviacion's brand new A330 in their business class cabin. This is a completely reimagined product and from first glance it's almost unrecognizable from the older product on the 767. In a 1-2-1 setup, each seat has direct aisle access, and this reverse herringbone seat style offers a good amount of privacy, but more importantly, all seats are identical, so you aren't rushing to book a seat that has the counter on a specific side. My seat is 2K, but once I got there I saw it reclined with a do not occupy sign on it. I alerted the crew who told me that the flight was exactly half full in business class so I could just move to 3K instead. So instead, I welcome you to seat 3K, my new home for this 10 hour flight to Madrid. Let's take a journey around the seat starting with the seat itself. The headrest wasn't adjustable but it was fairly comfortable. The main part of the seat was a different material and in my opinion it was even more comfortable. Along the aisle is a wide armrest. It offers some privacy but it's mostly this wide so that it can fit this little cubby in it. With the push of a button you can open up this enclosed storage. It's not huge but it can fit chargers or amenities that you have with you. In addition, the armrest can be raised and lowered in order to make a wider space with the seat in bed mode. On the other side we see the seat back in front of us and I gotta say that I am a fan of this detail. On the top of the seat back we also have this tiny little coat hook. In front of us is the TV, which was touchscreen and had a remote. The tray table slid out from under that with the click of a release switch. It slides out and then can be unfolded to make a surface just large enough for the meals. It is just a bit wobbly, however, if you place things at the end. Below that is the footrest, although it is a bit far until you're in bed mode, but to help with that, there's this raised platform leading up to it, which is good for resting your feet any other time. There's two windows at this seat where we could see the ramp, the terminal, and the observation deck, with all the people presumably with friends or family on this flight. We also got a great view of that Boliviana de Aviacion logo on the wingtip of this flight. The counter along the window had a couple flaps. This first one was to access the remote. It's kind of funny just because I feel like this big of a flap is a bit overkill for just a remote, but oh well, I didn't design the seat. There's another cubby behind that which has some in-seat storage including the charging and headphone jacks. When in the seat, I left my devices in here while they charged. Behind that is the literature pocket with things about the airline and safety card and air sickness bag. There's also this little cubby that opens up. I'm assuming it's for whatever personal literature you brought on board, but it didn't fit the seatback literature or my laptop. Over my right shoulder is a reading light that can be swiveled. The dimming feature is actually just down below the counter as part of the seat controls. Which, by the way, look like this. This little touchscreen panel had all of our seat adjustments and light controls. And the overall number one best thing about this seat was over my head, and it's the individual air vents. Big time win. As for the amenities, just after sitting down I was offered a bottle of sparkling or still water. I chose sparkling since you never really get that choice. They also took our drink order at this time. It was orange juice, champagne, or mimosa. You know I had to choose that mimosa. There was also these headphones at the seat. After being so impressed with the cabin, it was kind of a letdown to see earbuds instead of actual noise-canceling headphones, but at least we had something. They did have this amenity kit, which was a nice bag, but inside, however, was definitely basic. It did have a comb, eye mask, earplugs, and socks. I just wish we could have gotten a dental kit and lotion since I ran out for my last amenity kit that I brought with me. The bedding included a few things. First off was this pillow, mostly for just relaxing. It was a bit small and not super thick. There was also this pillow, which was much larger and allowed for a more comfortable sleeping setup. Then was the comforter. It was a great material and branded with the BOA logo. Once setting up the bed, it proved to be super comfortable. 
Now I've been wanting to try BOA for a little while, but there was a reason I came at this specific time. In the past, BOA has leased a number of aircraft, but recently they had a fleet of 767s, and these things were dinosaurs. I mean, if you want to see them, go watch Noel Miller's old video where he flew on that product. They were around 650 767s in operation in 2020, and since then, LATAM, the largest 767 operator in South America, retired almost all of theirs, and most of the world's existing 767 operators have planned their replacements by now. As of November 2023, BOAs have officially done away with their last 767, probably for the best since these aircraft were ancient and had an average history of 7 airlines each. These A330s that we're on today arrived in October, and after staff training they were finally entered into service with an entirely reimagined cabin. These planes weren't originally with BOA, instead they all began their life with Virgin Australia from 2012 to 2020 before they retired their long haul network. At the moment, it's set up as a six and a half year lease for a quarter of a million dollars every month. I know that's probably normal for leasing wide body aircraft, but it still sounds like an insane amount of money, spending $9 billion per year on their A330s in addition to their new 737s and CRJ200. I think the greatest part of it all is that this major renovation of their in-flight product, they have taken themselves from a bottom tier airline to one that can actually be competitive in the very competitive western to eastern routes across the Atlantic Ocean, especially from Latin America to Madrid.
In flight, as we climb away from Bolivia's largest city, let's look into the in-flight entertainment options. The home menu has just four simple items, movies, TV shows, maps, and information about BOA. In the movies section, there's 16 movies in total. Not that the selection is all that large, but we can filter by genre to find things easier. You can see here the comedy genre is half of those titles. The TV section had 20 total shows, including the nine kids shows. Each one had multiple episodes varying from 3 to 10 from what I could tell. It can also be sorted by genre, but once again, there's not that many choices, so I doubt you'd really lose things. I do really appreciate the feature to add things to favorites, even if it isn't totally necessary on this flight. The About Us page had only two sections. The first is called The Birth of a Legend, and the second being Offered Services essentially one being the airline's history and one being the onboard product. Lastly was the map page. Unfortunately, it isn't an interactive map. Instead, it just scrolls through the different pages of information and maps. In addition, unfortunately, at this time there is no Wi-Fi on board BOA's flights. There weren't any menus on this flight, but instead, once we were in our seats on boarding, they took our dinner choices of beef, chicken, or veggie. I decided to go with the chicken and quinoa option. The chicken wasn't bad, surprisingly not dry either, as airplane chicken is usually bone dry. Alongside the main course was a simple little side salad, these two little slices of cheese and a grape in a fun little design, and this little chocolate dessert to tie it all together. To go along with it, I chose a Coke. They gave me the whole can along with a BOA branded glass, matched my BOA branding on the salt and pepper shakers and silverware. With dinner wrapped up, we were now cruising at 37,000 feet across Brazil before we made our journey across the ocean. With dinner wrapped up, I chose to drink a glass of tea while I wound down for bed and relaxed watching Two Broke Girls, one of those shows that I can really only watch if there's really nothing else on. Let's also check out the bed that we're working with. First off, the seats in the reverse herringbone offer a good size for sleep, especially with the extra armrest that can lower. Using the touchpad to control the seat, we see that there are presets, or the ability to adjust the recline and leg rest individually. Using the relaxing preset, we can get the seat into a relaxed position. It wasn't too bad, although I was either eating or sleeping for most of this flight, so I didn't use it that much. Assuming it's the same as other herringbone style seats, it's perfect with a bit higher leg rest. Then to the fully flat position from there using the other preset. Maybe it's just an optical illusion, but it appears that the seat sat at a slight incline. Personally, I was a big fan of this since I typically add a slight incline anyways. I do think that the bed itself is wide enough, but for a bit more space, we'll also go ahead and lower the little cubby partition along the aisle before actually making the bed. Starting off, we have the large pillow, which was a great size and didn't need any supplemental cushion. Because of that, I used the smaller pillow on the side to make a bigger space to rest my head against, but you could also just throw it on top as a second pillow. Lastly is the comforter. I opted to put the fuzzy side down, which made it significantly more comfortable. And with that, the bed was fully made. I found the seat to be very comfortable and the bedding to be a great choice, especially once I moved that pillow to the side. Once laying down, there was plenty of space for my upper body. The issue arose with the leg room. The footwell was plenty deep, but it was a bit narrow. I found that on my back, my toes were against the top of the footwell. If you sleep on your side, the issue is that you have to stagger your feet for them to fit, which just reduces the amount of space for your legs. You'll see that there's a fair amount of privacy in bed mode. I couldn't see anyone else in the cabin, and from the looks of it, they couldn't see me except for maybe my legs or knees. And the last thing we can do to get comfortable is to adjust the lights in the seat. I couldn't see them until the cabin was darkened, but essentially on the literature pocket's lip is a light bar that can be turned on or off with a seat control panel. With that, as we cruised off the Brazilian coast, I wanted to get some sleep and maximize my sleep before sunset, breakfast, and arrival. So I'll see y'all in a moment. 
Now awake, I was greeted by the sights of the many thunderstorms taking place over the mid-Atlantic. We were off the coast of Senegal and just over two hours from arrival into Madrid, meaning we had a little moment before breakfast was served. One of the main things that I'll say is that the seat controls are extremely bright, so whenever I rolled in that direction, and especially when I nudged them, it was shining directly in my face. The lavatory of A330s are remarkably basic. If you've seen my videos on other A330s, you'll know what I'm talking about. This aircraft fits that description as the floors are basic, the walls are plain, the only amenity is the bottle of soap, and the personal touch being the black countertop, although my guess is that that's left over from the previous owners of Virgin Australia. I also realized, speaking of Virgin Australia, in the galley was a ton of Virgin Australia branded items, such as these little crates. I guess it was all lumped in with the airplane and Virgin chose not to keep their catering bins, in addition to the purple mood lighting. Back at our seat we had the first view of land as we flew past Tenerife, and then shortly after that it was time for breakfast. While I got some work done at my seat, they came around to take our orders, but just for drinks as it seemed there was only one breakfast item choice. They brought our placemat and place settings while the other crew members prepared our meals. And here was our breakfast, with an assortment of items, the main piece being the dolce de leche crepe with sliced mango. It was delicious, but far too sweet for me for breakfast. Aside that was a cup of fruit with mango, pineapple, and a couple grapes. Aside that was a yogurt cup and a couple bread rolls. To go along with breakfast, I opted for some coffee, which came with two non-dairy creamer packets and two sugar packets. By the time our meal wrapped up, the sun had begun to rise and we were well within an hour of arrival to Madrid. That was perfect time to share that, to be quite honest, BOA has piqued my interest since I first saw it a year and a half ago, but I really knew nothing about the airline until recently when I took a deep dive into their history. Essentially, BOA was founded in 2007 as LAB, the former Bolivian flag carrier, ceased operation after 82 years making it one of the oldest carriers in the world at the time of its demise due to carrying $140 million in debt. Rather than bailing them out, the government decided to let its government-owned airline die off while they reimagined a new airline. In 2007, BOA was born after Bolivia's president decided to launch their new carrier. It was also created as a wholly government-owned airline with their hub and offices being in Cochabamba. After a $15 million investment and a leased 737, BOA first flew in 2009 starting solely as a domestic airline between La Paz, Cochabamba, and Santa Cruz de la Sierra. At the time, their competition sat with Amazonas, who flew mostly domestic traffic, and Aerosur, who was the main international carrier of Bolivia, even with a 747. 2012 was a big year as BOA surpassed Aerosur's market share, but it was also the year that Aerosur eventually folded, leaving a gap in the Bolivian market. This allowed BOA to have an open expansion to control Bolivia's international market. While on the topic of BOA's market share, just late last year Amazonas collapsed with their operator's certificate being pulled and running into trouble with its lessers. Since their launch, BOA has grown their net worth by six times until 2019 where obviously the pandemic and Bolivia's political instability kind of blew that all up. Today, they seem to be on the come up from their pandemic woes. Late 2023 brought the fleet renewal, including a revamp to their hard and soft product. In addition, Bolivia has been pushing their tourism market with some wonderful places, cities, and landscape like Cochabamba, Lake Titicaca, and all their mountains. In addition, in the last few years, as they settled into their current identity, the country has become much safer than its previous reputation for the last decade or two. With a $4.3 million investment into the Santa Cruz airport, the truly plan to grow the airport into the logistics hub for passengers and cargo, obviously being important as a landlocked country. 
At the moment, you'll find them on 11 domestic routes and 7 international routes, including the A330s being found in Miami, Madrid, and Buenos Aires, their first international destination. And while BOA still isn't found in any airline alliances, they have begun code share agreements with Iberia, Avianca, and Aerolineas Argentinas to help people connect at some of their biggest destinations. I'm always excited to explore the aviation markets of smaller countries, and Bolivia was no exception to that. Congratulations to them on this huge renewal. The product on BOA is mixed in my opinion, largely depending on what you're comparing it to. In worldwide standards, I'd give it a C. The onboard product was great with a few holes. The big thing that knocks it down is the airport experience. Compared to other South American products, I'd raise that to a B. Latam is a beast in and of itself, but other South American products vary widely. But in terms of long haul, I think this one is great, just not the best. Let's not kid around though, it's night and day compared to their old product. The business class on the 767 was old, dirty, and not even competitive. This product brings a whole new life to BOA. This is a product I would actually choose to fly over some others. The value, I think, is one of the main things that impresses me. This flight was cheap. Very cheap. Business class from Miami to Bolivia, the busiest route out of Bolivia, round trip can be found for $1,500. This flight from Santa Cruz to Madrid in business was just over $1,000. Comparatively, the nearby Latam flight from Lima to Madrid was almost exactly the same price before economy class. The business class ticket was around $3,000, almost triple what I paid for this flight. So people looking to get to South America for a good business class deal are going to want to check this out. So while Latam still has the best South American business class in my opinion, BOA definitely gives them a run for their money. I will say that the economy fare was like $600, and while I didn't get to see that product, it seems that for most people the extra $300 to $400 for the business class seat would be more than worth it. Now the biggest pitfall in my eyes is the airport experience. In my opinion, They've just made an onboard product on par with some great international business classes, and if they really want to match those international business class standards, a few changes to the airport experience would go a long way. First off, there was no sort of business class priority lanes, not for check-in, not for immigration, not for security. Now, check-in at least wasn't too busy, but that could be due to just how early I got there. Also, and this applies to economy and business classes, the security scene was a nightmare. Having check-in open four hours early, but security three hours early, doesn't work well in these small airports. To delay our entry to security for another hour and a half on top of that was just painful. There was a whole lobby of people traveling to Madrid waiting to go through security that would bottleneck the whole process. I'm still not sure why we couldn't just go through security, but that really left a bad taste in my mouth early on. A small pause from our final thoughts just because when we parked at our remote stand it took a bit of time before we were allowed off. This was because for whatever reason they needed someone in a specific seat. They pulled her and her bag off and then the two immigration officers asked her questions on the stairs for about 10 minutes or so until they eventually detained her and were okay to deplane. Fun little bit of entertainment, although I'm not exactly sure what the situation was. 
Now back to our regularly scheduled program. Once through security, the terminal itself was alright. For an airport that size it was nice, but nothing too special. The main thing I found strange was that at their hub airport, BOA didn't grant any sort of lounge access for free to business class passengers. To get into the lounge, it either took a priority pass or $33. Only Air Europa business class passengers got free access. The boarding was fairly organized, more so than most American or European carriers, I thought, with the stalls for each zone clearly marked, so rather than have gate lice, people could actually line up with their zone. Plus, we got to see a big dog at work. On board was great. The seats were modern, they were super comfortable, and with the cabin just over half full, it felt nice and private. The food served was super tasty, I thought, although the breakfast was a bit too sweet for me. But the chicken dinner was great. The crew was great and even spoke surprisingly good English. I even tried to speak Spanish since when I flew Latam, only one of the business class flight attendants spoke good English. But when I spoke Spanish, they asked if I wanted to speak Spanish or if they should speak English. The choice was great to have for sure, especially for people less comfortable speaking Spanish. The entertainment options were alright. There were some popular English options, but I think I'd run out of things after flying one or two times. All in all, the value for BOA is there, and overall I definitely enjoyed the flight on this airline with no major accidents in their history. At this time, Skytrax has them as a two-star airline, but it seems that rating is from before this new product, so I'm curious how much that increases with this year's evaluation. If they are able to ever grow their long-haul market, I could definitely see myself flying with them again, but that's just my take. Let me know what your thoughts are on the new identity and flagship of Boliviana de Aviación. What would you choose for your next trip from Europe to South America? Let me know. Until next Sunday, however, safe travels, and I'll see y'all next time.